Welcome, welcome to Arizona Real Estate News, where today we're excited that we've got our special guest, Barry Habib. Welcome, Barry. Hey, guys. How's everything? Oh, Good. man, it couldn't be better. We, st we still have Pat, What's My Rate, McMasters, and the dynamic duo of Jackie Smith with Arizona. I, I can't even talk. I'm so excited. Century 21. <laughs> I don't even know who I am. I'm so excited. Yeah, and Ruby Graff with Century 21 Arizona Foothills. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> well, Barry, let me let everybody know who you are. And I read your bio and had a few surprises in here for me, which was kind of fun. Uh, you have an Amazon number one best-selling book, Money in the Streets. You frequently appear on CNBC and Fox. You're the CEO of MBS Highway. You are a three-time Crystal Ball Award winner for 2017, 19, and 2020 by Zillow and Pulsonomics for the most accurate real estate forecasts out of the 150 top economists in the U.S. 2019, 2019 Mortgage Professional of the Year by the Mortgage Professional Magazine. That same year, finalist for the prestigious Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Named to the esteemed Mortgage Global List for 2021 by Mortgage Professional and the St. Armand Ventures Businessman of the Year for 2021. And as an innovator, you founded many successful companies like Mortgage Market Guide, Healthcare Imaging Solutions, Certified Mortgage Associates, Founding Partner in Social Survey. And you were a leading mortgage originator doing $2 billion in sales just by yourself. And this one I really enjoyed, lead producer and managing partner for Rock of Ages, the 27th longest running show in Broadway history. That's really cool. And you produced Chris Angel's Mind Freak at Planet Hollywood in Las Vegas. So you're pretty diverse out there, my friend. That's fun to see. <laughs> Sounds like Tiger Woods' introduction when he, how many golf tournaments he's won. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of fun to... Uh, to kind of just explore in different areas. So I'm very grateful for the opportunities. Well, we're excited to have you on the show because, you know, we have a lot of subscribers that are following the pulse of the real estate market. And I describe it now as everybody's waiting. They're either waiting for rates to go down and they can sell. Or they're waiting, waiting for rates to go down and they can buy, or they're waiting for the market to crash so they can buy. This market to me, I see as like it's frozen. Everybody's on the sidelines. So we know people have a lot of questions on where the market's going in general. So I'll just kind of tee that up and say, what do you think in general right now? Where, what are we seeing? Cause this is really a weird time. So uh, waiting is probably not, not a good approach because if you're waiting for the market to crash, you're, you, it's certainly not going to happen. So that's, that's off the table. There's no, no chance of that whatsoever. There isn't going to be a housing bubble. People that say that just don't understand housing. Uh, there's, like anything else, it's dependent on supply and demand. There's just far too little supply and way too much demand. So the fact that interest rates have gone up into the upper sixes has slowed demand, but even the slower levels of demand are overwhelming the limited amount of supply that's out there. So it's just going to be continued upward pricing pressure. In fact, 33% of all transactions, you see multiple offers, but and it has it's continued to accelerate. So when we take a look at 2022, so many people were expecting a crash. Now we got 6% appreciation. I missed the crystal ball just by a hair. We predicted 5.5, but we got 6% appreciation. This year we're predicting 5.8 in 2023. But what you are seeing is a turning point. From June of 2022 to the end of 2022, we did see modest price declines. Now, like anything else, depends on where you are. But if you talk nationally, about 2.5%. Now, certain areas in Arizona, like Phoenix, they saw a little bit deeper um, drop in prices, but that's already started to turn between January to now. We've already seen prices come back and probably are about near where those all time highs were already. So you're going to have a positive amount of appreciation, certainly in 2023. And again, that's just because of the lack of inventory that's available. Inventory comes from builders completing homes, and we have good visibility based on, you know, builders that can't just blink their eyes and a home appears. When a builder goes to build a development, you know, there's a lot that goes into consideration. Do we have roads? Do we have sewers? Do we have uh, water? Do we have uh, utility? Do we have roads? Do we have schools? There's a lot that has to go into this. And as that is contemplated, in order to get an approval, it may take a few years 
for that to start to happen. So we know how many homes are going to be built over the next couple of years. And on and, uh, the United States combined, it's about 1.4 million. However, uh, 1.4 million homes, you have to account for about 100,000 homes every year that get replaced because of aging. So that's a net of 1.3 million, but the demand is expected to be somewhere between 1.5 and 1.7. So there's going to be upside pressure on it. And if rates drop further, well, then you're going to yeah. see a lot of upside pressure. So waiting for that is a mistake. Waiting for rates to come down, that might seem like a good strategy, but you know, I could, I could give you a quick example. If you like, I could share my screen and show you sure. um, a, an interesting reason why that doesn't doesn't fly. So let's take let's take a look at um, at a couple of things here. I'm going to just show you. Let, let's take a look now. I'm most of my time is in Florida. I just took a a actual case study, and and this is actually a, a good one because it's conservative. It's only assuming that mm -hmm. in, in Palm Beach County you're looking at about two percent appreciation in the next six months and about three percent in the next year. So it's not a lot. So this is an actual case study. Somebody's saying, well, should I wait because I could pay one point, get six and a half percent today to buy a million dollar home, or I can wait a year and pay five and a half percent or wait six months, maybe and get five and a half percent, because we all think rates are coming down based upon inflation coming down and that'll eventually happen. So maybe I'll wait for rates to come down. Wouldn't that make sense? The problem is, is that over the next six months, even with two percent appreciation, you're going to see a big jump in appreciation. And over the next year, once again, it's even more. So that means one of the things you'd have to do is if you wanted to keep it at 20% down, you'd have to increase your loan amount, which cuts into your savings. So if you took a look and you said, okay, I would save $421 a month if I waited for the lower rate over six months or save $380 a month if I waited for the lower rate over a year. But I give up appreciation. I give up amortization. So look at the money I'd be losing in this particular case study. In just six months, I'd lose 25,000 bucks. Now, if I take into consideration that, well, I could refinance when the rates come down. So let's put the cost of refinancing and let's account for that payment difference over six months. I'm still ahead of the game by over $19,000. So what you have to understand is that you can take the higher rate today, look at the appreciation you're going to receive and the amortization. It will certainly outweigh the difference. And then you take into consideration the cost to refinance, which is not that much. And you'll wind up way ahead of the game. So in almost all of the scenarios that are out there today, it does not make sense to wait. It's only going to become more difficult because the demand will continue to be there. Pat, did you have a question? No, I mean, yeah, just in general, Barry, I mean, you've been in the markets, going back to your bio, um, you know, you've seen a ton of markets over what, last 30 plus years. I mean, I like in this, I look at 2008, people were, you know, we had a tough market. And like you said in this uh, one podcast, you said a couple you know, a week or so ago, you go, this is not a tough market. I mean, it's for, obviously for originators because there's business out there. But do you see this market is just kind of strange looking over the last 30 years? I mean, overall, if you put in context of all the markets you've seen, it just, it, to me, I've been doing it 23 years. It just feels kind of, there's so many different dynamics going on out there right now. So, Pat, so, Pat, I got, were you going to say something else, Pat? No, no, I just was going to say, I just got to get your overall view and like what you, how you put this in all the other markets you've seen. So, Pat, um, I, I've been doing this more years than I want to admit. You know, it's, <laughs> um, it, it's 37 years now. So, um, I've seen a lot of different marketplaces and I've tried to be a student of the market as well. Mm -hmm. And there have certainly been markets that are reminiscent of this. You know, just back in 2014, the market was very reminiscent of this. Uh, when you look at the amount of transactions and when you look at the dollar volumes, this is by no means a terrible market. But the contrast from 2020 and 2021 is very stark. So that's what many people try and fantasize about. But that was an anomaly. You know, you're not, you know, let's pray we don't have another pandemic. Rates were that low unnaturally because of Fed buying that brought rates on mortgages down to two or I'm sorry, to three or even less than three percent, you know, in the high twos. That isn't a normal situation. So to compare things to that just doesn't make sense. If you take a look at this market and you say, okay, I, I can I can bitch and I can complain about it, or I could be proactive. I mean, this is truly an opportunity. Look, there's going to be 4.2 million existing homes purchased this year, 4.2 million of them. There's going to be another 700,000 of them that are going to be done on the new construction front. 
So that's 4.9 million homes. When you take a look and you subtract out of that cash transaction. So if you're a realtor and you're listening to this, there's 4.9 million transactions. How many do you need? Okay. You don't need all 4.9 million, right? So how many can you do? Okay. If, if you're saying, look, I, I'd like to be in the top 10% or 15% of income earners. Well, you know, for a real estate agent, if you did probably about six or seven transactions, you're there. So don't worry about the other 4,899,990 units. You'll just, yeah. just do a few yeah. units and you got it. If you're a mortgage professional, now some of those are cash transactions. We still have three and a half million that are with a mortgage. And then you got 1.3 million people refinancing this year. So there's a lot of refinancing going on. They're almost all cash out debt consolidation, which makes sense. So you don't need that much to get your share. So I think people just love to complain and bitch as opposed to being proactive. Look, if you showed people we just showed on the cost of waiting, that's one thing. Another mm -hmm. thing you could do is if you're on the mortgage side, or well, you're talking to your customers or you're showing them how you can save by doing a cash out refinance to debt consolidate. That's something that many people are not even thinking about. They could say, oh, well, my client's got a rate in the threes. So let's say they have three and a half, which a lot of people do have rates in the mid threes. And they don't want to go to six and a half or six and three quarters. But that's understandable. But they may not be paying 3% when you combine all their debts because their home equity line has now gone to nine. Their credit cards are now 22 and a half. Their, um, th their business loans or um, car loan is 11%. So they've got a lot of debt that when you combine them, is a blended rate that's probably well above 5%, maybe above 6%. So it's not that big of a difference. Now, if you combine that debt, pay it all off, use the equity in your home, because the average amount of equity people can pull cash out on in the home is $185,000, according to Black Knight. The average amount of equity they have total is about $235,000. So, you know, because you can't pull all the equity out. So when you look at, hey, I can take some of that money out, pay off my debts, bring my payment way down, and then if I apply the savings in payment towards my new loan that I'm taking out, you could save 10, 15 years of payments on your mortgage. So it's it's not the actual interest rate. It's the amount of interest that you're paying. You mm -hmm. can pay at a higher rate, but if you use that wisely, you're paying so much less than interest. I mean, you know, to, to be, you know, just to put it in perspective, would you rather pay a thousand dollars interest at, on, on 6% or would you rather have 3% and pay $5,000 interest. I mean, you know, so I, we all would rather pay the $1,000 interest, right? So people are too focused on the rate and not focused enough on the strategy. I think that's a great analogy. I wouldn't have put it into those terms when I'm speaking to a buyer, for example. But when you think about adding up all those interest rates and payments they're making over time, bringing it into one, even though that interest rate might seem higher on the mortgage, you're still saving so much money. That's that's huge. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Ruby. It's you're you're 100 correct. And then once again, if you could save 12 years worth of payments on your mortgage, mm -hmm. you know, now, now you're talking about you know an enormous amount. That's that's like that could be your retirement right there. So, Jackie, do you have a question for Barry today? I do. And Barry, thank you again so much for being with us. I have been a huge fan of yours forever. Um, I've been in the business for 34 years myself. You got me beat, but one of the things, uh, you know, I've never seen such a quick moving, volatile market in all my years. When, back when we had the Great Recession, I could see it coming. It was apparent. It was written all over the wall. Now, my biggest concern, and this is what, what I'd like to get your feedback on, is, you know, a lot of people are waiting because they think the rates are going to come down. But at the same time, we have all these people that are rate locked in their homes that don't want to put their properties on the market because they've got 4% or less. And then 42% are cash buyers. And so my biggest concern is if we do see rates come down into the fives, I'm worried about that frenzy taking off again. Well, you're 100% right. It will be a frenzy, which is why it's wise to get in ahead of that high rate, as crazy as it sounds right now, is your friend if you're a buyer because it will, it, it's, you, you will get a lower rate, but it's going to be at a higher price when rates do come down. Now, you did mention that there's a lot of individuals that are reluctant to give up their low interest rate in the threes to go to something in the sixes. It's, it's also the same thing with debt consolidation. So if you, what a lot of people wind up doing, Jackie, as you know, when they purchase that new home, they sell their home, they take their, their equity that they have from the sale of their home minus the cost to sell, 
And then they're going to put the whole thing down on the new home minus the cost to buy. Instead of doing that, which is usually a pretty big chunk, put less money down. Take some of that cash to wipe out all your debts. And what you discover is there's not as much payment shock going from your home with three and change percent to the home at six and change percent. And we are seeing this more and more and more, depending on the amount of debt people have. And, you know, credit cards are at an all time high right now. So the amount of credit card debt people have is is quite significant. So it is very possible. And we've seen a lot of this that you can go from a three and change rate to a six and change rate. But by paying off your debts, you actually have a lower monthly payment on the new home, which is also more expensive. So it's just, again, it is all about strategy, which is why it's more important than ever for a real estate agent and a mortgage professional to employ these strategies as a team and to say, hey, you know, we're going to look at your situation right now. I think that for real estate agents, probably one of the bigger issues that you guys are facing is what what do you, if, if I was a real estate agent today, the issues that I'd be facing, I believe, are my client doesn't want to give up their low rate and go to a high rate. Um, I, I also think that it's difficult today if you're looking at uh, at, at a home because you might have to bid over asking price. So being able to do that evaluation is another one. Um, and go ahead, take a look, let's take a look at that chart you wanted to pull up there. That This was a question from a viewer, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to throw it up while you were talking there. I was trying okay. to position it. But, uh, you know, you live by the tech, you die by the tech, right? So, so, so one of our subscribers said, why is there a difference between the 30-year the fixed rate mortgage and the federal funds rate. And his question was, and I'll pull it off here, I'll ask it uh, specifically. He said, um, uh, let's see, could you please have Barry talk about this chart? I don't see how mortgage rates are going to drop without the federal funds rate dropping. Well, because the Fed funds rate, if you notice the spread between the two can get quite wide. Pick up that, pick out that chart again, and I'll show you. The, the, they don't move in lockstep. Okay, while it looks like over time there may be some differences, but you know, if you take a look in the 80s, you had mortgage rates and the fund, Fed funds rate inverted. You've had it several times in the past. Sometimes the spread gets real tight, and sometimes you could point to periods of time when it's extraordinarily wide, you know, where you see the Fed funds rate very low and mortgage rates much above it. So we're now at a period where they are quite narrow right now, where we are to the extreme right, where there's very little space between Fed funds rate and mortgage rates. So you can have an inverted situation once again where mortgage rates can, as they have in several instances, get below that Fed funds rate. You see it in the 70s, you see it in the 80s, and, and you, you've seen it where the Fed funds rate and mortgage rates can have, a, um, ha have an inversion. Fed funds rate is a one-day rate. It's an overnight lending rate. Mortgage rates are out there for 30 years. Mortgage rates care about inflation which is what's going to drive mortgage rates. They're not tied to the Fed funds rate. You can see there's very, sometimes mortgage rates are cheaper than Fed funds rates. Sometimes Fed funds rates a little bit more expensive. It's a lot. So they're not correlated to one another. Mortgage rates are highly correlated to inflation and they would have come down, except we have unusual amounts of selling in the mortgage-backed security environment. And this all stems from the banking crisis that we have. Let me see if I could pull something up which better illustrates that to you so you could see what the correlation is. So and, go ahead. I'm listening. Barry, and just to kind of write on that, I mean, there's also a lot of people don't realize there's a lot more technicalities with the mortgage-backed security with the servicing rights, uh, the bank, you know, banks, with the, obviously if rates are high, they, you know, the roll off, if, you know, rates are high, they know that, you know, eventually if rates do fall down that they're going to get these, you know, refinance and roll off the books. So there's a lot more intricacies to MBS, the MBS market, than just people would know, right? Well, that's correct, Pat. You do have the servicing values that are part of the value of a mortgage-backed security, which have been really cut significantly due to the fact that there's a limited amount of servicing that's expected now because there is the thought that rates will come down. So people that are at 7% or 6 and 3 quarters percent won't have that mortgage very long. So the servicer that benefits from longevity in a mortgage will have less fees that they get every month. There is a servicer that collects your payment, that pays the taxes, the insurance, they get paid for that. So you pay them at the closing of a mortgage. You have to anticipate how long the expected rec receipt of payments, how long they, their work is expected to be done. So 
right now it's expected that there will be a tremendous amount of refinancing done for any loans in the upper sixes or over 7%, which is why that servicing value has gotten sucked out of it. So you normally have a relationship between the 10-year treasury and mortgage rates on 30-year fixed of somewhere, let's just round it off and say it's around 2%. But today it's closer to 3%. And a lot of that is because the servicing is being sucked out. So I have a chart here that, um, that shows the amount of deposits in the bank and then the amount of money in a money market. And this goes back you know, for a little over a year now where you could see this is 2022, here's 2023. And you can see that money markets have skyrocketed. I'm not, Barry, I'm not seeing the chart. You're not seeing it? Okay, well, let's take yes. a look. Let's make sure that we got it here. So we're going to go back and try and reshare right now. Uh, let's go to present and share the screen window. Let's make sure that this time it pops up. Tell me, do you see it there? No, you got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this shows you in 2022, then in 2023, monies that are in deposits in a bank. And you can see that's really dropped dramatically. And here you see money in a money market. So, well, let's just bear that in mind. And I'm going to explain to you a little bit about how our banking system works. And this is really why the banking crisis is so important to understand. So the way our banking system works is, let's say you have $100,000. You give that $100,000 and you put it on deposit in a bank. Now, the bank is going to pay you very, very little interest, and many of us know this. You're probably going to get a fraction of 1%, like a tenth of 1%, so tiny amount that you get in interest. The bank is able to take that $100,000, and now, while they're paying you interest, it's, it's still something. It's a liability. they got to make money with that money. They can't use all of it. they got to keep about 10% of it on hand, and the rest they can go out and they can invest. So what are they going to invest it in to make money? Well, car loans. They're going to do uh, business loans, home equity lines of credit, things like that, where they're going to make a lot of money on that and they're paying you very little. That's how banks make money. But they can't put all of the money in there. Why? Because those are the types of investments that they're locked up, where you know, if the bank needs the money back, they can't say, excuse me, I gave you that car loan, give me the money back. So they put some of it in there because they're going to make a nice big spread on that. So they like that. But here's what happens. If you say, hey, I want my money back, Remember, I only have 10% of it on hand. So I've got to give you all your money back. Now, I've got other people's money. You know, I'll have Jacqueline's money. I'll have Ruby's money. I'll have Rick's money and other people's money. So, Pat, if you wanted your money back, I can go ahead and piece it together and give it to you. But what if everybody starts pulling their money out? They all say, hey, I want my money back, or a lot of people do. Well, then I've got to sell some stuff. I can't sell the car loan. I can't, you know, I can't do that. So what do I do? Some of the money that I invested in is in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. So I don't get as good a rate of return, but it's still a lot better than the 10, one-tenth of 1% I'm paying. So I'm still making money, but it's liquid. Now, you saw what's happened, right? That money's come flying out of deposits and into money markets. Why? Because consumers have gotten smart. They've seen that a year ago, I wasn't getting any money in a money market fund. But because the Fed has lost their mind, and yeah. increased interest rates parabolically by 5% in a year, now people are saying, hey, wait a minute. If I have $200,000 or $250,000, I'm pulling it out of the deposit, tucking it in the money market, and I'm going to make myself 1000 bucks a month. That's real money. Instead of getting nothing on it, I'm getting some real return on that money, and that's what consumers are doing. So the banks are seeing their deposits flee, and now they're trying to raise capital to give people their money back. The only way they're doing it is by selling treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. This is why you have an unusual situation. Normally, as inflation declines, mortgage rates decline along with inflation. But here we have inflation declining. Mortgage rates aren't doing that. And I want to show you another chart here that kind of illustrates the, the interesting aspect of it. So I'm going to pull up those charts again, and I'm going to... Hopefully see this, this. Now you got this back, right? There you go. So, yep. Yep. so here's the way that here's the way that it normally works. OK, so I, I want to just show you this here. This is inflation goes up. Mortgage rates go up. Inflation comes down. Mortgage rates come down. The Fed was buying mortgage backed securities during this period. It's called quantitative easing. So inflation was skyrocketing higher right here. Mortgage rates stayed low. Why? because the Fed was rigging the system. It was extraordinary buying. Now we've seen inflation come down. 
But mortgage rates have not come down as much because there's extraordinary selling due to the banking crisis. And I'll just run through this to show you like where we see inflation going. So inflation would is, is going to be headed lower. And that's because a big chunk of the way inflation is measured is in rents and owner's equivalent rent. And as you can see, clearly the trend has been coming down, but it averages it over the past 12 months. So when you average it over the past 12 months, the way that it's reported in the inflation numbers, it's like this. Now, the Fed looks at this, but what they should be looking at is this. And this is how they made the mistake in the past. We, back in 2021, all the Fed members were saying, hey, we need more inflation. They were begging for it. We're not even thinking about thinking about hiking rates. And Janet Yellen was out there screaming, we've got to go big on quantitative easing. And why <laughs> did they make that mistake? Because what they saw was this. They said, hey, you know what? When we look at inflation back in 2021, we're seeing only one and a half percent because they were looking at a lagging indicator in rents, which represented 43% of it. In real time, rents were going up at 15%. So the Fed screwed us by looking at this instead of this. And they're doing the same to us again because they continue to look at this lagging indicator. They're being data dependent instead of looking at what's happening in real time. So inflation is going to come down. We're headed for a recession. We're going to see inflation come down. Thank goodness real estate does well. Mortgage rates do well during recessions. So the outlook is good. It's just that right now, as you said in the opening, this is an odd time. Can I jump in real quick? Um, do you think, you know, you talk, I've heard you say about the, the Fed, you know, the, um, I know you're, you, you do a very good job of being, um, being nice to them, even though you, I know you probably want to bash them a little bit further, but do you think that that 2% number is antiquated based on the, you know, it's not even adjusted for inflation. That was the number you said was made up about 25 years ago in a conference room. So, the Fed has this 2% target, which seems yeah. to be their holy grail. And they look at that 2% target, the measurement that they use, it's called PCE, the personal consumption expenditure. It's a measurement, but they look at the core rate, which takes out food and energy. And this is what there's their, their favorite measure of inflation. And that's what they're targeting for inflation to get to. I'm going to show you in a second how difficult it is to get there, but let's answer your question first. So the Fed says 2%. Where did this 2% come from? It seems like it's talked about so often. Well, this was because now Janet Yellen, who was a very bad Fed chair, and she's not a great Treasury secretary, but before she was a Fed chair, she was in a meeting with Alan Greenspan. And she said, well, she said, what should the rate of inflation be? And Alan Greenspan was like, well, you know, this, this is, it's movable. It's in flux. He says, in theory, you could say zero, but that would never happen. You know, Paul Volcker, who was said to be one of the best Fed chairs ever, he was cutting rates when inflation was at 4%, you know, 4.5%. So it, it depends really on market circumstances. So you shouldn't be tied to a number. And Alan Greenspan said that to Janet Yellen. But she pushed and she pushed. And she says, well, where would you put it? If you had to put a number on, where would you put it? And Alan Greenspan said, maybe 2%. But he said, I hate to think what would happen if that would get outside this room. Sure <laughs> enough, it did get outside this room. And yep. you see these boom bust cycles because the Fed is chasing a fantasy. You know, 2% could be good, but maybe 2%. It's, it's total, as you said, Pat, correctly. You nailed it. It's a made up number. It's out of thin air that they pulled this out of, out of their rear end. And yep. now, like, this is the holy grail that Jerome Powell is holding on to. Now, let's remember, Jerome Powell, he is not an economist. He's a lawyer. So he does not understand economics like somebody who has studied it really well. Like you. A lawyer. Okay, so you know, put it this way. You wouldn't want me representing you on a murder trial, right? So, <laughs> but, so what, why would we have Jerome Powell in the most important economic position in the world? It boggles your mind. Yeah. Wow, I had not heard that. Well, you Barry, I know you're uh, running out of time and I wanted to give you one last quick question. And that is, we have paused. Are they done? So here's the thing. The Fed has indicated that they want two more rate hikes. They've done this many times before and then backed off. We just saw it recently in 2018. So not that long ago, about five years ago. So it's kind of reminiscent of that period of time. I believe that when you get the inflation report on July the 12th, that's for June's inflation, 
you're going to see the headline consumer price index is going to come all the way down from its current level. Now, remember, this was 9.2% a year ago. So it's come down a lot. Now it's four. You're going to come see that down to 3%. That's a very precipitous drop. And in one month, it's going to drop one full percent. That reading, maybe we get lucky, it might even say 2.9, is going to make it difficult for the Fed at their next meeting, which is like July 26th, around there, to, to raise rates again. They may kind of just take a pause because inflation will be coming down. Now, the number they are looking at is the personal consumption expenditure, that PC. Let's pull up one last chart here to show you why it is so hard to chase 2%. I'm going to show you right here in just a minute. Let's go right to it. And here it is. Now, these are the replacements that we've seen since April of 2022 all the way to April in 2023. That was the most recent number we got. Now, I, I believe it's the 30th or the 31st, uh, the 30th of this month, pardon me, the 30th of this month, we're going to get the PCE number for May. And that's going to replace this number for May. So the PCE is currently at 4.7%. That's way above the Fed's 2%. But 2% means you need to get to a level where you're averaging 0.16 for 12 months. Jeez. We haven't seen that except one time in July of 2022. Okay, so look how hard it is to get that down. We're trending somewhere around 4%, 3.5%, 4% here. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to happen that easily. So if you're waiting... For, the, for inflation to come down on its own, well, good luck. You're not going to see that on the PCE core because it is very hard to get it to a 2% level. The answer is the Fed is so foolish that they're going. They, if they do continue to hike rates, they're going to do it until they break something. And break something means break the job market, break the economy, send this into a bad recession. So let's pray that the Fed looks at charts like this because they typically don't that they get wise and they understand that chasing 2% is a pipe dream and they've done so much, so rapidly. We already have had a banking crisis with the three largest bank failures, except, except for Whammo, the three top bank failures, and the three combined have totaled the next 25 together. Wow. It is, it is and, and on all the pain that consumers are feeling, the higher mortgage rates, everything that we have experienced, they caused the inflation, and now they're panicked because they know they made the mistake and they, they screwed us and they caused this, that they're going to make an equally bad mistake in trying to rectify their first mistake instead of having the patience and the wisdom to just let things move in a more manageable pace. The economy needs time to breathe and get through this. By the way, the jobs numbers that you're seeing that appear so strong, that's BS. The jobs market is not. So there, there's two reports within the jobs report that we get. There's the business survey, which requires a lot of modeling. I mean, look, we have 167 million people in the labor force. You think yeah. at the end of the month, they're going to tell how many jobs were lost or gained. They have to yeah. use a lot of modeling. <laughs> in that model, they use something called the birth death ratio, birth of businesses, closures of businesses. It is terrible at capturing points of inflection. It's not so bad if the job market's doing this, but if the job market's doing this, it lags terribly. If it's doing this, it lags terribly. So what we see is that the number that it's saying was created last month was 339,000 jobs, way above expectation. Holy cow, job market's great. But when you look at the household survey, which is the other survey, that's where you get the unemployment rate. This is where you actually call people. Hey, do you have a job? Did you lose your job? It showed not 339,000 jobs gained, 313,000 jobs lost in wow. one that's why the unemployment rate went from 3.4 to 3.7%. Now, 3.4 is very, very low. This is also a low number. But here's what we have to remember. Recessions begin not when the unemployment rate is high. It's when it reaches its lowest level and on average moves up about a half a percent. That's when recessions begin. Now, we, we, we're at 3.4. We've already gotten to 3.7. There's going to be a jobs number that comes in kind of stinky. And when that moves up towards like a 4% unemployment rate, you can bet we're in recession. And that's when the Fed's going to open their eyes. They're going to say, oh, my gosh, we threw us into recession. The job market's getting really weak. We're seeing job openings decline. Hours worked are being cut. You know, look around. Just You can be a better economist just looking around. The greatest investor of all time was Peter Lynch, all time. 
He was the best fund manager ever. He managed the Fidelity Magellan Fund. And his theory was he'd go into the shopping malls and he'd see what was hot, where were the lines, what would, would people do. And th that's what he, so he was a believer in that. Just take a look around you and see, look, do you notice that there's hours being cut? Have you tried to go to your bank and see banks being closed or hours being cut or less openings on Saturdays or things like that? If you just say, hey, wait a minute, I'm noticing a lot of changes lately. That's because we're seeing a contraction out there. The Fed won't know about it because they're data dependent. It's old data. Uh, three months, four months later, the Fed finally sees it and realizes it. But you and I get to see it in real time if we pay attention. Yeah. Awesome. Great stuff. Well, Barry, again, thank you for joining us little people out here in the state. Oh, of you guys Arizona. are awesome. You guys are awesome. You're wonderful. <laughs> it's indeed you, a Barry. pleasure to have you on the show. I can't, uh, I'm uh can't thank you enough. It's, it's, it's fun to learn all that you shared with us and, uh, and we'll have to do it again sometime. So. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. I appreciate it. I know you, you talk in front of thousands of people and the people talk in front of us for, you know, guys, you know, people in the desert, uh, appreciate it. You know, I, I take to your uh, information very, you know, uh, every day I use it. Um, you know, it's, it's helped my, it's helped my business. I mean, I, I'll tell you uh, just real quick. I mean, I've saved my people, you know, Jackie and Ruby. I'm kind of an interest rate, um, you know, techie there, geeky there. And I watch, you know, watch the trend lines and I've saved people. I mean, honestly, using your service, I'll just give you a plug is using your service. I mean, you know, everybody thinks you're, you know, you got the interest rate, you know, you, you'll have a lock alert, you know, just to protect people's pipelines. But I've watched your, the charts and I've, in many years, in the last couple of years, I've used your service. I've saved people three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 within a week, week and a half by, locking at the right time. Pat, thank you. That's very, very kind of you. It's an absolute privilege to be here with all you guys. I know that you're doing wonderful things for people and helping people understand what's going on. And this is a large financial transaction for most people, the largest financial transaction that they make. So the fact that you're doing this to help individuals is great. And it's a privilege to be with you. By the way, I love Arizona. I love going out there. It's, it's one of my favorite places to go. I go back and forth on the East Coast between Palm Beach, where I spend most of my time in New Jersey. So uh, getting getting out to Arizona is always Look a Look forward to seeing you when you're out here next time. You bet. You bet, yeah. folks. Thank All right. you, Thanks everybody. Again, you guys Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.